Catch, catch a bubble means be quiet. <laughs> hey, are we on? Okay, we are on. Good morning. Uh, I am not John Haller. More's the pity. However, and we are praying for him today. By the way, I mean, he was uh, seriously ill last night uh, and has no voice today. So we need to pray. Um, and again, just continue to remember one another. I would also like to introduce my brother's in the back, and he's got his two sweet kids downstairs. But that's my brother. And uh, God bless him. I love you. So it's been fun. And we also have some other visitors here today. I won't embarrass you because we're on live stream right now, but it's so good to meet you all. And if you, if you see anyone here that you don't know, please, before we leave, give them a hug and a handshake because that is truly... We want to let them know how much we appreciate you guys being with us today. Thank you for traveling to come and uh, join us here. We're celebrating the freedom of worshiping here today without the fear of imprisonment and persecution, at least at this hour. And we want it to extend uh, so that we can continue to preach the gospel and minister to the church. So let's have a word of prayer quickly, and then we'll get into our time together. Father, again, we thank you for today. What a blessing it is to be your people. God, what a blessing on our lives it is to have the grace and mercy and the love demonstrated that Jesus died for us while we were yet sinners. Father, I pray again this morning that if we are uh, here and we need to know Jesus, that we will make that right. That We will take the testimony of 1 John this morning to heart and understand how valuable and essential it is that we know Jesus Christ in this life. And Lord, I pray that if we've been Christians, that we've been slacking off, or we've been struggling with the areas of vice and carnality, Lord, all of us are beset by many weaknesses. We all stumble in many things, as the Scripture tells us. And God, we humbly ask for your forgiveness today. And we ask that we could see victory through the strength that you give us to overcome temptation and to live godly, holy lives. Lord, I'm praying that for me. And Lord, I just thank you once again that you are going to be glorified here today as we look at your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, by way of explanation, this Bible study that we're going to do here right now was actually designed for a smaller classroom setting. By that, I mean today, I thought I was coming here and I would have a whiteboard and we would do our little thing in the book of 1 John. How many of you have read 1 John? Oh, it's amazing. It's an amazing series of letters, 1st through 3rd John. So if you want to go ahead and turn there at the uh, end of your New Testament there, towards the end. I've got a series that we're kind of starting right now. We're also praying for Mike Clapham, who uh, will be recovering from his foot surgery for quite a number of weeks at this point. We're going to get him back in the saddle here uh, as the Lord gives him strength. Until then, you have to listen to me. So uh, today, again, a special case because Brother John is sick. But um, I thought we would start a study in 1 John. And I'll tell you why. I think we're at a very crucial time of need in the church today that we are able to embrace foundational truths as well as some of the really deeper things. And as I was praying about it, I realized that the foundational truths of Scripture that are very straightforward and, and if you will, easy to understand are deeper things. You understand what I mean? We have basic Christian teaching, we might call it, Uh, And John is so great when you're talking to somebody, when I'm witnessing to somebody or I'm telling them, hey, if you want an introduction to the Bible, read the Gospel of John. Sometimes I don't know why I say that, but what I've been saying later later also has been read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Read, and why do I point people to John? Because there just seems to be a way that God used him in such a simple way of layering absolutely phenomenal, astounding, glorious truth. Meaning he makes these assertions and then he builds on it in these epistles. And I thought, First John, what a timely word for the church from the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's what John called himself. And so by way of introduction, really quick, I want to give you a few facts about the Apostle John. And I want you to turn to John 19 uh, while I'm talking here. John or Yohanan. Okay, well, well let's talk about the title here. The title that I, I got just kept coming. It wouldn't quit. So it's got a bunch of words in it. You guys want to hear the title of the series? Okay, God, love, light, and life. 
colon, studies in 1 John. <laughs> That's, and I tried to condense it, and I couldn't, but because it, it just kept coming. It was amazing. But today we're going to look at God is light. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 1. Now, I don't know how long we're going to go through there. I've been told that we're here till 3.30 today, so I'm going to try to shorten it so that we can get to a, a late afternoon lunch. No. John was, uh, again, a fisherman, a son of Zebedee, brother of James, who were called one of my favorite titles growing up that I always loved in the Bible, the Sons of Thunder. Who wouldn't want to be known as that? I thought that was great. But John and James, because of their demeanor, Sons of Thunder. Sons of Zebedee, which is also a great name to have for your dad because it just sounds really great. Also, partnered with Peter and Andrew, and they had Zebedee and sons and company fishing on the Sea of Galilee. They had servants with which they left their nets when they left to follow Jesus. So we assume he's from a pretty well-to-do situation. They were doing well. More importantly, if you will, if there is a real more importance of some of this, when Jesus calls these guys to be fishers of men, calls them to be his Talmudim, his disciples, to take his yoke on them and to go forth and, and, and share the good news about Christ, he had an inner circle out of that 12. How many of us know that? Right? He had Peter, James, and John seem to find themselves being called away a little bit to pray over here, especially with him, to witness the transfiguration, an amazing uh, linchpin upon which the letter of First John seems to keep pointing back to. I absolutely adore that, and the transfiguration is such an exciting event where Jesus shows them behind the veil, if you will, of his heavenly glory. They see the Shekinah, they see the, 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 the brightness of who Jesus is. He's God in the flesh, and they get it kind of peeled back a little bit, possibly on the snowy slopes of Mount Hermon. Great story. But John's there. He's the disciple, and John refers to himself as this in the gospel that he wrote, which I love. He's the disciple who Jesus loved. And he says that a number of times about himself. He's the one, remember, he reclined on Jesus' breast uh, there by the table. As they're reclining around the table at the, at the Last Supper, he's the one leaning against the chest of Jesus. And again, as weird as that sounds to us in this day and age of kind of weird, uh, that wasn't anything weird at all. That was affection, but that was like brotherly love of a depth that it just seemed that John is the one he could refer to himself as the one who Jesus loves. I, I, there's a special thing there about that relationship. He was commissioned to take care of Jesus' mom. I'm going to two highlights here in the life of John from the Gospels. John 19, verse 25 to 27. We know the story. Jesus is hanged uh, on the cross there beaten, bloody, purchasing our salvation. Soldiers were mocking him, dividing his outer garments. John's there, man. But standing by the cross of Jesus, verse, wait a minute, what did I say? 19, right? Uh, chapter 19, verse 25, yes. It says, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And by the way, John's mother, Salome, was believed to possibly be the sister of Jesus' mom. Just to throw that in there. But anyway, when Jesus saw his mother, verse 26, and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Folks, I offer to you that there's a special relationship there for you to sit down and look, at, for you to hang there, look down at your mom and say, please take care of her, as though she's your mom. That touched me about the life of John. That hits me about Yohanan. That's like, wow, Yeshua, Yohanan, there's this, there's this uh, joy of relationship that they had. Go with me a few chapters over to John 21 as a second highlight that I just really thought about immediately. Peter's restored on the beach, breakfast on the beach with fish. It's a good time. Jesus is resurrected. Peter's restored three times. He's, you know, told to feed and tend the, the, the lambs and the flocks, kind of undoing the three denials that Peter did. Love that story. Uh, and then we know what Peter went on to do in the power and the vigor of uh, belonging to Christ. That's John 21, 15 through 17. But then 18 through 25 of John 21, the last verses of this gospel, I absolutely love this 
part of the story too. Always have. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, and he's talking to Simon Peter, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Cheerful prophecy of your life? No. And what do we know? Tradition tells us Peter was the one crucified upside down. Uh, definitely a place you didn't want to be led to go at the end of your life. However, he did it because why? He loved Jesus so much, I'm not worthy to be crucified right side up. All of the apostles, except John, met violent deaths and persecution. That right there is a testimony to changed lives, is it not? They went to the grave because they knew Jesus rose from the grave. Amen? That's heavy. So we love the words of these apostles. And John is a unique individual here in, in some respects. Verse 19, Now this Jesus said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. That's Peter. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? That's John. Amen? Peter looks back at John. Verse 21, Peter, seeing him, wow, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? What about this guy? Something happens to you in your life, or God says, hey, man, you got a rough road ahead of you, or whatever it's going, well, what about him? We kind of want to know, like, well, wait a minute, how come I'm singled out in this way, or, or what about him? What does he say about John? Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Do you love that? I love that. What's it to you, man? None of your business what I'm going to do with John. And Jesus isn't being rude, and again, he's not being a jerk any more than John the Baptist was. Love tells the truth, but what is he trying to do? He's arresting Peter's self-centeredness. or may, I don't know what motive Peter had. I'm not going to judge him. I'm just going to say he's looking at John going, well, what about him? And Jesus goes, what's it to you what I do with John? If I want him to remain alive until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And it says, verse 23, therefore this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Don't you love this, this, this part of the, the gospel? John's writing this. It's like, that was, that was said about me, you know? And tradition, of course, arises that John would, you know, all around that John's not going to die. We'll talk about that in a second. Verse 24, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen, let's pray, let's go eat lunch. <laughs> Great statement. And let's say it all. Jesus is way too big to be contained in these Gospels. But as we read these interchanges, as we read the life of His disciples being affected and changed by the presence of the mighty Christ, and then we see what they did as they went forth from here to serve Him, with great fervency and with their very lives, aren't we excited to be in the church today? Amen? Don't you see the disconnect with some generations of people? And, and my, I was one of them. At one point in my life, I went through this, this, this years of doldrums. I would just be sitting in church going, oh, man, more Bible stories, okay. You know, yeah, I've heard that one before. And you might be in here struggling with that today. But I want to encourage you, today is a great time to be alive. And we are living in the power and the legacy of what Jesus did through these early apostles. I'm excited about the gospel. I'm excited about 1 John because it holds answers to this world. It holds the answer because it points to the Messiah. And it's going to be my broken record refrain because John had a broken record refrain according to church tradition. You want to hear this final story as the intro to who this John guy is? I love it. It tells us that sometime before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, John would leave Jerusalem and he would move to Ephesus, modern-day Turkey. And he was, had oversight of the Asian churches, the seven churches in Revelation. Many believe John's the elder of those churches. John's the overseer of what was going on in those churches. He became a mighty voice for the gospel. A legend starting in 81 to 90, you have Domitian who was a monster reigning in Rome and he was persecuting people. And the legend goes that John was thrown into a pot of boiling oil. What do you think of that? 
Think about it. You know what? And this is so weird. Every time I go to McDonald's, I think of John. <laughs> I do. I watch, I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. My life, my life gets these images in it, and I can't get rid of them. I'm thinking of flaming copperheads you know, over the first hour, and I'm thinking of... When I see boiling oil, I think of John. I really do. And you know what's weird? It probably didn't happen. Go put that in your book. It probably didn't happen. Because not many people survive boiling oil, but the legend kind of arises. He's getting boiled in this big cauldron, and he stands there preaching at people. He's preaching from the pot, which I love. If that happened, that's awesome. But that's really, honestly, a thing among some in the church. They believe that that really happened. But here's what did happen. We know that he was exiled to Patmos, a salt mine out there in the Mediterranean, and he received what? The revelation. Okay? He lived a hard life. You don't, you don't go live out on that island because you're enjoying your summer fling or whatever. Look, he was in hardships. He did get persecuted, but here's the neat part about John. You ready for this? This is so exciting to me, man. At the end of his life, and this is also church tradition, but this one I really think seems to ring very true because a number of voices confirm this, okay? But here's the thing. As an old man, and he lived to a ripe old age, he died in 100 A.D., he's the only one of the apostles that did not get martyred. What does that say about what Jesus said? What's it to you if I let him live or whatever? God had a plan for John, just like he had a plan for everybody else, and just like he has a plan for you. But this guy's a foundational apostle, writing the Gospel of John, writing 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and receiving what? The apocalypse of Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ on Patmos. Love it, okay? But when he was an old man, it was said that he had to be carried to the church in Ephesus, to the meetings. Nothing was going to keep him away, but they carried him in on a little stretcher thing. And again, I've shared this before, but there, there was said to be such a pervasive love of Jesus emanating from this man that when he came in the back of the room, if you were in the front of the room, you still knew he came in, even if you were faced the other way. Isn't that great? How many of you is that true of today? When you came to church, we all went, oh, I didn't see him, but I know so-and-so's here. And I'm not putting anybody's name on that. We all ought to be what? Exuding the love of Jesus. And I don't know if that was true. That's a legend. But here's one other thing. People got irritated at him. You're like, how could you get irritated at a man who is so loving? Because the only thing he is said to have said in his old age was constantly repeating, little children love one another. And out of irritation, some people said, Master, why do you always say that? And he said... Here's what he's said to have said. It's the Lord's command, and if we do this, it is enough. I'm going to confess to you. I don't know if that tradition is absolutely true. It's not in the Bible. But it certainly goes with the character of the man, Yohanan, that we read. When we read what God inspired him to write, I'm telling you, man, God shares his light, his life, his love through the heart of of this apostle, and again, it's coming from God. Wouldn't it be great? I don't care even if this is not a true account of his life. I want my life to be that way in the end. I want people to look at me and go, you know what, that's Steve. Hey, he may not have been the best this or the best that or best looking or any of these things, but he loved Jesus and he loved God's people with the love that God gave him for God's own people. Amen? Shall we pray and go to lunch? Not yet. Stick with me a little bit. Because it gets, it gets awesome what God used to pen through the Apostle John. Background and history of the actual letter of 1 John. Listen, we have two disciplines that you need to hear about. This was, again, designed for a sort of a Bible study classroom setting over here in which I would write it on the board. And, uh, uh, but we're doing it out here today. Everybody say apologetics and polemics. Apologetics is defending the faith, defending the Bible, the veracity, the truth of God's Word and what is contained therein. We're telling the world, listen, here are the answers that will help you in your faith. If you're having trouble this morning and you have obstacles to coming to faith because you've got this really big problem or intellectual question, apologetics can be useful in defending the faith. It means a defense. Polemics is another thing that the Bible does very pervasively. Polemics is something that John Haller is exceptionally gifted at. Can I say that? I mean, really. What do you suppose it means? It means telling the truth to the church. 
refuting error is part of that. Taking teachings in the world or in, 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 in other religions even, and again, apologetics and polemics kind of blend on this point, but it's about defending the faith and the truth of the Scriptures over and against the wicked antichrist doctrines that are out there. Can I just say it that way? Anything that is not of God is antichrist. It's against the Lord and His Christ by very definition of what it does. It opposes what God's Word has communicated. John writes 1 John as a polemic and an apologetic in some senses to what? The pervasive philosophy that was creeping into the church at the time. Two things. Everybody say Gnosticism and Docetism. I hope I'm pronouncing the second one right. But anyway, we all mispronounce it if I'm not. Anyway. Gnosticism is this idea, and again, it was made, it's very complicated, very deep. We're not going to go into all these things, but essentially some very basic core teachings was that all matter was evil. Everything that is of the flesh or of this world is wicked. It's fallen. And not only just fallen, it's just intrinsically in itself. It's just evil, period. Your hunger, your drives, uh, anything that's associated with your physical body, oh, it was, it was, it was just completely corrupt and wicked. So therefore, it would be impossible, the Gnostics came forth and said, for God to become a man, for Jesus to take on a body of flesh, because it would mean that what God would defile himself by becoming a physical flesh and blood human being. But do we know that that's what happened to Jesus? Jesus was 100% God. He was also 100% human without sin. Okay? So that goes against Gnosticism, but the Gnostics said, well, Jesus had the Christ spirit in him, the Jesus, uh, the spiritual Christ that came down on him at the baptism and then left him before he went to the cross. So the spirit of Christ that made Christ divine left him so that by the time he's on the cross, what is he? He's just a sinful, wicked guy, body of flesh. We know that that's what the early church and we call heresy, okay? In Modern-day Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus spiritually resurrected, not bodily. It's a form, again, of these kind of things. Gnosticism actually rears its head in any time you hear somebody, Jesus gave me secret revelations, and those revelations go against the Bible. It's Gnostic. We're not to listen to it. But these people believed that they had special things, and you could work your way through all these degrees, through knowledge. That's what Gnosis is. Anyway... Down at the baptism, spirit taken away before the cross, couldn't have had a human body because that would have made him evil and defiled. Well, John is going to rip that one to shreds by testimony. Secondly, docetism means to seem, and that is that Christ only seemed to have a human body. Couldn't have had an actual body of flesh and blood. It just That's what everybody saw, and it looked like, boy, that's a vivid spiritual body. But that's docetism. Two heresies that John is going to refute. So my question to you, why study 1 John? Number one, easy answer, church answer, right? God's word. We're going to study it. But I also think people need to hear the foundational truths that are going to be laid out in this first chapter and the ones following that. 1 through 3 John is an incredible unit of instruction to the church by an elder who loved Jesus and he's the one whom Jesus loved. I mean, you can't get better reference and a more, to me, enjoyable, powerful package of teachings uh, anywhere else in the world but the Bible. And this particular portion, I hope you're going to enjoy as we begin in 1 John chapter 1. We're going to go through a couple verses today. I would like to get through 10 verses in a half an hour. What do you think? That's the first chapter. Yeah, me neither. So, we'll see. No, but seriously, the introduction of this is wonderful. It starts right out. Now, notice, it's not going to start like Paul's letters. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, dot, dot, dot. It's me, guys. Here's my letter. John just goes, launches into this beautiful personal testimony. And I want to emphasize one thing before we read this. Today, the atheist, in all his ire and anger, the liberal critics, deniers of the Bible as God's word, they can't refute this eyewitness testimony for its historical validity. They can say, along with everybody else that does this, hey, I don't believe it. Okay, 
I leave it. I don't, I don't, you know, you can have it. I don't want it. I'm not going to submit to it. Hey, everybody has the right to do that right now, don't they? This is an age and a, and a time of, 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 I mean, you can only call it grace to the world while God is allowing them time to repent. Am I right? You understand what I'm saying? We need to throw First John at people in a big old package of love. That's what we need to do. Look at how he begins. Look at the conviction of the introduction, the evidence of the incarnation. And I'm going to ask you, what event do you suppose that he is talking about as we read? But let's go verse by verse. Sensory evidence that Jesus was really there. Sensory evidence that the incarnation is real. That when the Word became flesh, it indeed, He indeed took on a human form, and we, John says, saw it. Look at what he says in verse 1. I love this. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, auditory. What we have seen with our eyes, or gazed upon in the Greek, visual. What we have looked at, in the Greek, seen with the eyes of us. What's he saying? We've heard and we've doubly seen. We've not only witnessed this personally by seeing it, but we perceive what we have seen. We have looked upon this intently. And then he says, and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Stop right there. Very first verse. He's sitting there going, here's eyewitness testimony that we have seen, heard, and touched Jesus. You know, you can't lean against the breast of somebody who ain't there. Or somebody who doesn't have a body. You can't high-five, which I don't know if they did, but let's just assume there were times where they did the equivalent. They shook hands, they hugged one another, they were elated, man, we came back and the demons were subject to us. I'm not sure he did that. But there was affection, there was touching, there was a man loving each other. Our hands have handled this guy. Thomas, what? Invited to what? Go ahead, put your hand right in there. The body. Jesus eats on the shore of Galilee and swallows fish. And he's got enzymes to help that happen. He's got a real body after he was killed. Or after he gave up his life, right? John says we saw, heard, and touched the word of life, Jesus himself. Now in the ancient world, eyewitness testimony carried a massive amount of weight. Right? How are you, how you going to deny my experience, you might say? And today, eyewitness testimony in historical documents carries a bunch of weight. Why? We weren't there, but he says he was. And we have no good reason to believe that he's lying. In fact, when you look at the rest of their lives and how they went to their death for this, it would make no sense at all for somebody who really didn't believe that Jesus resurrected and it was, it, it, that we heard and saw and handled the word of life, that he wasn't really there or that Jesus never existed. No, John says, I'm there. And you know what? In the end of the whole day, take it or leave it. Well, prove it, John. We're not proving it today. By faith, we receive that John's telling the truth. John's convinced. Are you convinced by faith today? That's the big question. Let's keep going and look at what he says. It was an observational eyewitness. Jesus was real flesh and blood, not some Gnostic emanation with some spiritual form or non-form. Verse 2 says the life was manifested. And again, he says this, we have seen and we and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. Now I like this, okay? The word manifested, John likes this word. He uses it eight times in 1 John. First one being here. And manifested means what? To may, be made known, to be shown, to make clear, visible, or to come into view. That's what happened when Jesus came to the earth. He was manifested, and John says here, to us, we have seen it. Who's he talking about? The disciples. Those who saw and witnessed Jesus there, and they were with him. He says, we've seen him, and he's from the Father. It's caused them to do something, which we also see in this book a lot. He says here, remember verse 2, we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal 
life. Folks, this is again the chain of reaction that we see from these men. They saw it, heard it, handled it, and then said, we're going to share it. Ask yourself in your life, when you met Jesus, and again, I'm not talking physically, we don't have, we don't have the uh, privilege, maybe? Is it a privilege that they saw Jesus in the flesh? I think it would be. That would be awesome. But Jesus says again, blessed are they who have not seen and yet still believe. So he's like, that's even better. That's what Jesus says. By faith, when you met Jesus, what was your resulting action? Theirs was what? We testify, which is the word for having been a witness, also including the word martyr, meaning, hey man, to death if necessary, we are telling you Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. We saw him. We walked with him. We listened to him. We saw him do miracles. We handled him. And so we bear witness, and it says we proclaim, which is the declaring of the reporting part of it. We opened our mouth and just kept flapping our gums about it. Because why? We met him. He's real. And when you open your mouth for Jesus, you get in big trouble. Amen? Is that why we have a hard time in the church today doing that? And when I say we, I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying we. Rhymes with me. Because it starts with all of us. Are you testifying and proclaiming the eternal life that you have witnessed when you came to Jesus Christ. And somebody might go, well, how do you know? You didn't see him and hear him like they did. No, I didn't, but by faith, hey, man, hey, man, I'm going to trust that Jesus is real, and I have seen so much fruit and evidence in my life that he's real. In fact, I have an abiding inner witness that just absolutely will not let me alone. Do you know who that is? The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Every single person who believes in Christ, he's the Spirit of Christ, he dwells within you, you are now the temple. And when somebody preaches the truth of God's Word, or when we read it together, or we say amen together, that's because the Holy Spirit in us is an inner witness going, I'm with you guys, I love you, God says. The triune God involved in our life. And and, and I can't shut up about it when, when I'm properly thinking about the truth of God's Word. And then life happens during the week, doesn't it? Right? I'll go on and on on Sunday about it, and then I'll get home and go, man, this happens or that happens, and the wind gets taken out of me, and sometimes it's two or three days before I sit and go, oh, yeah, I belong to Jesus. What's going on here, right? Anybody with me on that, or am I? Do I need to quit? (laughs) I struggle. I struggle being present with the realities of scripture sometimes you know i'll get the things of life will just jump in there and you'll find yourself going for extended periods but you know what when i read this i just go amen this is true how about you it's true oh but what about i don't know but that's true amen i got the word of life living in me i have eternal life from him i have the spirit of christ dwelling in me he will never leave or forsake me and when somebody comes against my lord of the scriptures it's not them that I'm going to even listen to. Don't get me wrong. I want to know why you believe what you believe. But at the end of the day, guess who I'm trusting over any word of any man ever? And I think I've seen enough in my short life or whatever. I'm 45 years old, but I've seen enough to go, you know, man doesn't get it right most of the time. I'm going to leave that right there. But that's the truth. Let's keep looking here for a moment. We have seen, he says, so therefore we testify. And who does he testify to? He says, we proclaim, this is verse 2 again, to you, the eternal life. Listen, that's to the church. This is to the church that John had oversight over. And by extension, it is to us today because the Scriptures still speak to us about the eternal life. That's where you're going to find it. That's where you're going to find out about this glorious Christ, which was with the Father and manifested to us. Again, John writing 1 John, he's also writing John 1.1, which talks about the word was with God. The Word was God. He's with the Father. Jesus has come to proclaim to us the individual, the indivisible, invisible God that none of us has ever been able to see at any time in His unveiled glory. Jesus placards Him. Jesus wears the sandwich board that says, this is my Father. Look at Him. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one because we share the divine essence and it's only Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three who's and one what. And the what is the divine essence of the one true God. 
Jesus manifested him to us. Amen? I always quote my dad on this. Forgive me. Got to do it again. Jesus is the person of the Trinity that you're going to see with a body someday. That pretty much, I don't know where he got that, but if he got that from just a, a way of saying it in Scripture, I've always loved it. Because you know what? I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lamb, and he's going to have the body with the scars, I believe, to testify that he was really real. Amen? Great, man. Mm. There's no mistaking that he was with the Father and he was shown to us. Here, the Talmudim, the disciples, but by extension, how do we know? The Bible has revealed to us who Jesus is. So the path here is a chain of revelation, and we're going to talk about that just in a moment. Look at verse 3. What we have seen and heard, then, he says, we proclaim to you also, so that, what's the, what, what's the reason for this faithful transmission? He says, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Listen, there's a purpose to the proclamation here that we have to pick up right away from John. Why am I telling you these things, church, he says? Why am I writing this to you? Why am I testifying it to you? Why am I opening my mouth and preaching about it? Why am I known, if you will, for loving Jesus and following Christ? It's so that, what, our fellowship can be engendered together so that we can grow together in fellowship with each other and with the Father. Now, what did Jesus pray in John 17? Lord, may they be one as we are one. This idea of fellowship or koinonia, communion with God. I have to ask you, do you have that in your life? Is it evident in your life? But I'm not just asking with God. I'm asking with other Christians. Because what does he say here? Fellowship with us and what? God. Do you have that experiential oneness with other believers in faith? And you know what I mean. Oftentimes we say it like uh, we're closer than flesh and blood relatives with the body of Christ. And that includes the body of Christ in Indonesia this morning and in Madagascar and in some tribe in the Amazon and in India and uh, European countries. You know, I don't want to leave them out. Anywhere across the globe right now where people are worshiping Jesus today, we are one in spirit with them. See, see Tommy Tenney, remember this guy, this false teacher, a number of years ago he had a book called The God Chasers. And on his teaching lectures, and I'm not sure if it's in the book because I didn't read the thing, but his whole thing was he's a oneness Pentecostal, so he denies the Trinity. So he's already got a problem with fellowship, right? If you're going to say that there's no Father or Holy Spirit, well, then not even God within his own being has fellowship and communion like the Bible teaches that he does. So he's already denying that part, but he told everybody else that the unanswered prayer of Jesus was John 17. That we may all be one is the only prayer that God never answered of Jesus. And it wasn't just him. I think it was a couple other people saying it. But here's the thing. What does that mean? Well, when you look out across the church, we're all divided. We're all got denominations. We're all fighting each other. So, so we're not really one with one another or one with Christ. What do you think Christ meant when he prayed that? Do you think he meant some sort of a visible unity? Or an ecumenical unity where, hey, well, we can join with the Catholics too because after all, we're all believing the same thing. We're all No. Listen, the church is going to be the most corrupt and fighting institution on the face of the earth until Christ returns. Do you know that? Why? Because it's the one organism that the devil has his crosshairs on more than anything else. If he can get the church to blow it, if he can get the church to ruin the witness of the gospel, if he can get leadership to fall in scandal and stumble many, if he can get the body of Christ to mess it up and fight and turn people off to the gospel and, and make them think we're just a bunch of hypocritical hate mongers, if he can get the, the world, the church to do that, which he is in many circles, then yes, disunity and chaos is what a lot of people think of Christianity. But I'm here to tell you some good news. God has answered fundamentally the question of Christian unity for all time. This is not the unanswered prayer of Jesus. We are one with each other if you belong to Christ. But pastor, the name of their church is different. 
doesn't matter what's on the sign in the front. It's what's who's in your heart. If you belong to Jesus, then you are one with that believer worldwide, whoever they may be. This has implications, folks. I taught on racism uh, for a series at one point, and I'm sitting here going, that, that person whose color of skin you might hate, you're one with them if they belong to Jesus. You are so close and interwoven with one another on a spiritual sense because of what Christ did to unite us with His death and suffering that we are in true fellowship with one another when we understand and enjoy the truths of Scripture together. Amen? I'm in fellowship with all you guys here today, and that's easy because I love you all. But you know what? I'm even in fellowship with you if we have a disagreement in this world and in this life. But all of us need to come to the foot of the cross at some point in our life, believe in Christ, and His blood unites us because He's purchased us together. And i got great news. People are coming to Him every hour. All across the world today, people are getting saved this morning. And we're sitting there, well, why doesn't it happen here or there? Listen, it happens in accordance to the will of God. It happens in accordance to the human heart who repents. And here's the gospel. That, you know, you know, and, and, and that's a mysterious thing that's going on there. But the body of Christ is being built, and it's Christ who is building it. He's the head, and he's joining us together and knitting us together as we grow up into the one new man. And someday, we're going to be sinless, perfect, and completely and utterly, in the truest sense of the word, saved and in the presence of the Lamb. And it's going to be good. And there won't be any squabbles of the, of the other earthly things and the things we have here. Now understand what I'm not saying, nor what, would, what John would be saying, or what Jesus would say. It is, this doesn't mean then that we just go, oh, it doesn't matter what we believe. We're all in this together. Just name the name of Christ and you're in there. No. No. I cannot truly have fellowship with a person who believes false doctrine. Even though fundamentally they may be saved, but we can't, we're not yoked together. We can't walk together. We can't minister and have the full expression of koinonia with a body of believers or individuals who say, I don't care what the Bible says. Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't do what that says. And I refuse to fellowship with the saints. I refuse all the, you know. No. We're supposed to withdraw from a person like that who claims to be a brother. But what I'm telling you here from the first chapter, from the first introduction here today, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, but it isn't unless you know him. Amen? Folks, we have what we call, what the church calls closed communion here. Which means, if you're just somebody coming in here, and you don't know Christ, you don't believe Christ, you know what I'm going to tell you? If we ever have communion together as we have it, do not take the elements of communion. Do not break the cracker or the matzah and drink the grape juice in the name of what Jesus did for you if you have not received that he did that for you. I do. I really believe it's an application of drinking unworthily and it's dangerous. Why? Because that is a ceremony that can only truly with integrity be shared by people who truly are in unity and fellowship with one another because they belong to Christ together. Amen? Wow. Family stuff here, man. Family stuff from the apostle whom... Jesus loved, from the, from the disciple who Jesus loved and the apostle who was known for being so loving. He says this in verse 4, These things we write so that our joy may be complete. And what does that mean? Who's the we? It's the other apostles. It's the eyewitnesses of the risen Christ. It's the ones who walked with Jesus. And by the way, most agree that he is sharing from the personal experience of being at the transfiguration when they saw there that Jesus showed them that glory of who he was and it's such a significant amazing place with a lot of implications of what he was doing up there but these guys John being one of them was there going wow I am witnessing and I'm convinced thoroughly that he is God that's heavy the result of telling the church, the result of proclaiming this truth, the result of sitting here reaffirming, listen, we are eyewitnesses, it, it engenders and brings fellowship. And what? The result of that is that our joy is complete. Well, John's happy, man, when the church reads the letters and says, oh, amen, we're in this with you. Yeah, we too believe in the word of life. Yeah, we believe that you saw him. We believe in the eternal life that's proclaimed. We believe that he was sent from the Father and has now been shown to us, and we receive that. Oh, can you imagine the apostle's heart just exploding inside with joy? 
That's what I'm talking about. You guys get it. And I love here when we're talking about this and I see the nods and the amens. Why? We get it. Amen? We're part of the family together. Why? Because Jesus is so good. Not because of us. Okay. We've done four verses in the time allotted to me. I would like to do a few more very quickly. First premise of the whole letter. Remember I had four words. God is light, life, love, and another one. Light. That's what chapter one's about. God is light. Phos in the Greek. Radiance. It's used five times in 1 John, 73 times in the New Testament. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. In verse 16 of the same chapter, let your light so shine before men. Matthew 17, 2, and, and many other places. He became white as light at the transfiguration. God is associated with light. How neat is it that Genesis 1, 1, once again, begins with the words, in the beginning. And the first thing God does is let there be light. John 1, 1 begins with the words, in the beginning. And then it talks about Jesus, the true light. 1 John 1. What's the first phrase? What was from the beginning? Verse 1, and now we're talking about light. What's the significance? And then we could go to Revelation and talk about Jesus being the beginning and the end and the light at the end where we don't even need the sun anymore. Amen? Something's going on with beginnings and lights. Something's going on with the parallels here of the apostle as he's trying to knit together Scripture because it's all about the light. It's all about the true light. And what does he say here fundamentally about the nature of God? Look at verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him, and we announce it to you, he says, that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Listen, that should be the biggest amen of the day, maybe. Are you glad? Because if there was darkness in our God, buddy, we'd be in big, big trouble. If God was like the Greco-Roman gods, or the pagan deities that surrounded Israel, or any of the false gods we have today, we are in trouble because they are capricious, avaricious, pernicious. I don't know any other words that rhyme with that, but immoral, <laughs> evil, shifty, untrustworthy. The false gods sleep with one another, kill one another, adulterate with one another, and pull one over on mankind all the time. You couldn't trust them. You were afraid of them. They were bloodthirsty, wicked, devious, demonic beings, God says. All the other false gods are demons. Just forget it. Just forget looking for good character traits in the demonic. You will not find it. You will find only deception. You will find truly a brood of vipers that people bow down to all over the world if it's not the true God. Amen? But in our God, what is it? True light. The one who said, let there be light. And he has the Shekhanah, Shekhinah, excuse me, in his nature. He's got the radiance. He's got the brilliance. And he associates that with him all through the Old Testament. Light, is it a particle? Is it a ray? What is it? It's mysterious. It's beautiful. But it illuminates. It heats. It nourishes. It exposes. It's absolutely essential for life. And it is part of the nature and person of the one true God. God is light. That's the first fundamental message that we get from 1 John. And let me tell you something. That light has shone into the darkness of this world, and this world has not comprehended nor overcome it. Amen? That's John. John's like, I saw the light. I saw it radiating off my Savior on Mount Hermon or wherever mountain they were at. I saw it at the transfiguration. And God is light, and in His nature there dwells no hint of sin or evil. We can't emphasize this enough and we can't relate to it because we have hints of sin and evil in us, don't we? But God has none. God is perfect, pure, holy. There is no unrighteousness nor any chance of Him to be a liar or a thief or a wrongful destroyer. And that also means then, if God is light, if God is absolute and pure in all that He does and all that He is, that means every command He gave was utterly holy including the ones to destroy the wicked in certain contexts. We're not getting into those arguments right now, but I promise you those are the questions that the critics and the atheists are going to ask you. And somebody from the younger generation who goes out and gets Christopher Hitchens' books or you know Richard Dawkins and reads a little bit of that and comes spouting those arguments at you, oh my goodness, sort of a God that said to kill women and children of the Canaanite, you know, hey, wait a minute. I'm not here to justify why God commanded all kinds of stuff, and there are answers 
Maybe not ones that we're super satisfied with on the human level, but I tell you this, God is light and in Him is no darkness. Every single decision, decree, command that He has ever made has always been utterly righteous and holy, even if you and I don't understand all the nuances of it. Amen? That's it. So what do we say to the world? God's light and you need to come to the light to be saved. And Jesus Christ is the true light that gives life to every man. John also wrote in the first chapter of his gospel. Wow. It's so good. There's something so great happening here. Can I have two more minutes and then we're done? Nobody said yes, I could. So maybe I very quick. <laughs> okay. Listen. No, you know what? We're going to be done. Because the last half of the first chapter... And you'll have to all squeeze into that room in two weeks. <laughs> no, seriously. The last half of the five if-then scenarios. If this, then this. If this, then this. And it's really neat how he breaks down, or you know, how the first chapter seems to sort of break down in that scenario. Because if there are certain truths that are evident here that he's saying that you need to receive by faith that we're preaching to you, then your life must reflect this. If God is not darkness then your life better not be dark if you say that you walk in the light but you don't then you're in trouble i mean there's there's, there's some really cool if thens but let's close i'm going to reread the first five verses that we looked at what was from the beginning what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. And we have seen and we testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and which was manifested to us. Faithful chain of revelation there. We passed on what he passed on to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ, these things we write so that our joy may be complete. And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. And let's take it with us today as we go our ways. That God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. Not even a little bit. Amen. Father, thank you for your nature. Father, we thank you for the truths of First John. First, we thank you for his life and testimony. And Lord, even if those things were not uh, recorded in the Scripture, but they actually happened, who's to know? But we do know that John has gone down in history to be known as a faithful witness and proclaimer of what he saw and handled and believed in. Father, thank you for the faithful revelation that you used these men to write down these things and that you preserved throughout history the record and the testimony of what you moved them to say. The Holy Spirit is superintending these guys to write with their own little nuances and things, yet the truth is the same and it's unified and our entire Bible fits together to point to Jesus in every single book. What an awesome, beautiful revelation. Lord, it's the only one we need. We don't need more doctrine. We don't need more mystical, supernatural experiences, Lord. We don't need those. We have the completeness of your word. Father, I thank you, though, for the supernatural relationship that we have with each other as we belong to Christ, and most importantly, with you, Father, through your Son and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Father, may we do like John did and proclaim to this world, to proclaim to our age and, and to, the, to our mission field that is before us this week. May we go forth and faithfully testify and proclaim the gospel, eternal life, and the fact that you are light and have no darkness whatsoever in you. Father, we thank you that you dwell in unapproachable light, and we thank you that because Jesus sacrificed for us, that with his blood covering our sins, and the transformation that is promised us at the resurrection uh, or the rapture, Lord, the metamorphosis, whatever, whatever scenario it is that we individually exper you know, or experience, God, according to your timetable, we just want to live like lights in this life and point many people to you, the true God, and your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, next week, you're not going to want to miss Olivier Melnick.